So what I'm going to talk about today, the topic is the case for Israel and academic freedom. And first I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of perspective on the anti-Israel boycott movement. I'm sure everybody's heard about it. Always seems to be a letter every week or so in the Cornell Sun about it, op-ed columns, and that's good. People are taking an interest and people are arguing both sides, and that's fine. But I wanted to give you, start off by giving you a little bit of perspective. To a certain extent, you live in a bubble. And the bubble is that this argument's even going on. In most of the United States, in most aspects of life, the boycott movement is not even an issue. It's a little different than Europe, where it's a bit more of an issue. But here, it's other than on campuses, it's almost completely a non-issue. So I, I, I like to give students that perspective, because sometimes you can feel that the walls are kind of caving in around you, and there's all this discussion, and it's a hot topic, and the professors are mostly against you, at least the ones that speak up. And uh, students scream things at you, and they have apartheid, and they have, you know, on some campuses, mock walls and mock checkpoints, and all that sort of stuff. But that's not really what's going on in the United States, and you need to know that to start with. Gallup just came out within the last month with its annual favorability ratings for the U.S. population of foreign countries. And among all of the Middle Eastern com countries, Israel was by far the most, had the most favorable ratings. It was 72%. Uh, Palestinian Authority is 19%. I think North Korea was at the bottom at 4 or 5%. And uh, other than Canada and a couple of our closest allies, Israel is really at the top. And that's as high as it's really ever been. When you also look at Gallup surveys, which kind of do head on one versus the other, the gap between um, people who say they support Israel versus people who say they support the Palestinian Authority, uh, if that's a, a matchup, the gap is more favorable to Israel than it's ever been for as long as Gallup has been doing these sort of surveys. By, so Israel's actually, in the United States, not having any trouble. I mean, you don't hear of companies boycotting Israel. Certainly you don't hear of the Congress doing anything to boycott Israel. You just don't hear that. In fact, support for Israel is probably the single, maybe the only unifying issue as between Republicans and Democrats uh, in the United States. Uh, just by way of contrast, I saw another survey of favorability. It may not be apples to apples in methodology because it wasn't Gallup, but by contrast to Israel's 72% favorability rating, kittens have a 71% favorability rating. So Israel's actually doing better than kittens in the United States. Um, so we're doing pretty well. Uh, Israel is actually less isolated economically than it's ever been, despite what you hear. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the boycott movement, at least so far, has had a negligible effect on Israel's economy. Uh, Israel's exports are up this year. Israel investment in Israel by foreign companies is up this year. And other than a, literally a handful of musicians and other people who boycott Israel, uh, people are going to Israel. Tourism is up 20% this year. Um, you know, uh, interactions with foreign universities is up. All of those things are going well. Nonetheless, why am I even here then talking about this thing? And I'm here talking about this thing because, you know, bad things start small. And I consider the academic boycott, whether it's an academic boycott of Israel, or if it was a pro-Israel group boycotting Arab universities, I'd be just as much against it. Academic boycotts are a bad thing. And I'm going to hopefully explain to you why today, even if everything they said about Israel was true. All the negative things they said about Israel was true. You still should be against the academic boycott. And in doing so, you'd be on the, taking the same position that over 250 university presidents have taken, that major academic organizations have taken, and in fact, a, a newly formed group of progressives took yesterday when they announced Peter Beinhart, who uh, used to write for the Daily Beast, I'm not sure who he writes for now, um, against the Atlantic, but people who are very harsh critics of Israeli policies have come out saying academic boycotts are bad. So you're actually on the right side there. I'll tell you at the end why all the things they say about Israel are not true, uh, all the accusations and so on, but even if they were true on this campus, 
there should not be support for an academic work. I'll relate to you a couple of personal anecdotes from my own life that, or at least one from my own life, that uh, might give you some understanding of why I feel so strongly about this. When I was in college, at Hamilton College and also Middlebury College, I studied uh, Soviet Union, Russian language. And those of you, Soviet Union, you, now Russia is back in the news, but it wasn't. Anybody who knows anything about the Soviet Union knows that several million people died in the forced collectivization in the Ukraine of the, of the private farms. They had an extensive prison system called the Gulag Archipelago, where people disappeared into, if you've ever read in Alexander Solzhenitsyn's books on that. And I can tell from the blank stares, it's like, what's the Soviet Union? <laughs> uh, but if you study these things, they deported entire nationalities. Why, are, why did Russia just absorb today, announce they were going to absorb Crimea? Well, because it's 95, 99% Russian speaking there. Well, why is that? It's because in 1944, Stalin put the entire population of Crimean Tatars on trains and trucks and shipped them to Central Asia and to Siberia. Um, literally an entire nationality was moved and replaced with Russians. The Baltic states, they captured and controlled for many years until they split up um, in, the, in the 90s. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, they moved very significant populations of Russians in there. Those countries now and sometimes are only half native speaking, the other half is Russian. The invasion of Finland, you've probably never heard of. The invasion of Hungary in 1956 and Czechoslovakia in 1968. Complete lack of academic freedom. If you spoke out against the government, you were kicked out of school, or if you're a faculty member, you were fired. I mean, it was that simple. In order to advance to any degree of academic prominence, you had to be a Communist Party member, and you had to meet various loyalty tests. You had lack of freedom of movement. You couldn't just say, well, okay, I don't want to live in Moscow anymore. I'd like to live in what the time was called Leningrad. Now it's called St. Petersburg again. You couldn't just do that. You had to get permission to move someplace. You couldn't leave the country without an exit visa. Nonetheless, I don't recall any talk back then with all these horrible things. Stalin killed more people than Hitler. With all the terrible things they did, I don't recall when I was a student anybody talking about an academic boycott. In fact, it was just the opposite. We wanted to go meet their students. We wanted to go visit their universities. We wanted to bring their faculty over to talk to them. And we felt we were making a very positive contribution to the eventual peace process and the eventual demise of the Soviet Union through that interaction, through that dialogue. In fact, I studied in Moscow. I studied in 1980 uh, at a Russian language institute in Moscow and met many Soviets who at the time were our enemy. I mean, Khrushchev said he would bury us. I mean, they had, and still do, thousands of nuclear missiles pointed at us. Yet we wanted to go there. So from my own personal experience, when I hear about people who don't like Israel saying, because of that, we should boycott their academics, to me that's a complete non sequitur. In fact, if you're against Israel, you should want to increase that interaction. You should want to foster that cooperation. In fact, anybody who knows anything about Israel is the academics there are some of the harshest critics of Israeli policies. So to me, from my personal experience, it may, it, it's, it's a non sequitur. One thing doesn't follow from the other. The second thing I'd like to anecdote, it's not a personal anecdote, but I'm not a big fan of Thomas, Thomas Friedman who writes for the New York Times carefully you guys follow his writings, but for whatever the reason, he has risen to a level of prominence in, in the field of the Middle East. And he had, but he had a really good article about a month or so ago, and yeah, it was good because it was mostly reporting as opposed to him expressing his opinion. And what he wrote about was something called a MOOC, M-O-O-C. I don't even know what the letters stand for, but that's apparently the hot new thing these massive whatever, I think the M stands for massive, uh, and, and how Technion, uh, Israel Institute of Technology, Technion is in Haifa, is running um, a MOOC for students from the Arab world. Not just the Arab world, 
students outside of Israel, mostly the Arab world, mostly the uh, Islamic world. And um, Friedman recounts how this professor uh, at Technion is running it, and that as of the date of Friedman's column, there were about 4,800 registrations for the Arabic version. It's on nanotechnology, including students from Egypt, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Iraq, Kuwait, Algeria, Morocco, Sudan, Tunisia, Yemen, United Arab Emirates, and the West Bank have signed up for this Technion course online. Iranians are signing up, and I'm reading from his column now, for the English version. Because the reg registration is through the MOOC websites, some registrants initially didn't realize that the course was being taught by an Israeli Arab scientist at Technion. Um, and when they do, some of them unregister, but most of the others are sticking with it. And he says, Technion is funding the project, which took nine months to prepare, and this professor is donating the lectures. And here's what I found very interesting. Some 19% of Technion students today are Israeli Arabs, up from 9% 12 years ago, uh, the professor says. And here's the quote from this Israeli Arab professor teaching the course. If the Middle East was like the Technion, we would have already have peace. In the pure academy, you feel totally equal with every person, and you are appreciated based on your excellence. Now think about all the nasty negative things you hear about Israel suppressing Israeli Arab education, etc. 19% of Technion is Israeli Arab, non-Jewish um, Israelis. Um, there are people from the West Bank who study there. Uh, that's pretty incredible. If you look at the overall statistics for Israeli education, uh, while it's not, doesn't match percentage for percentage of population Israeli Arab versus Jewish, neither do we in the United States. If you look at racial minority populations on campuses, in Porter, including Cornell, they don't match the population in the entire country. So, uh, but nonetheless, 11% of total Israeli higher education is Israeli Arab, and that's a number that's increasing. But think about it, this course where Students from the Arab world, 4,800, have signed up because they so want to learn. Under the boycott, they would not be allowed to do that. And obviously, there's no other source of that education for them, or they wouldn't need to sign up for an Israeli course. That's who they want to boycott. So, you know, whenever they say that they don't want to boycott individuals, they just want to boycott institutions, well, they are boycotting individuals, and I'll talk more about that. They're boycotting that Israeli Arab professor, at Technion, they're forcing students who want to interact with that professor to participate in the boycott and cut off their interaction. So, um, what's the history of the boycott? The boycott that we're talking about nowadays is the American Studies Association boycott. Uh, it wasn't actually the first academic organization to pass a resolution boycotting Israel. The first was the Association for Asian American Studies, passed it last May, but it was a very small group. Other than me, I don't think anybody paid attention to it. Uh, but this was a bigger organization, and they passed a boycott resolution back in early December. The history of the boycotts in the Middle East is a history of boycotts against Jews in the Middle East. The earliest boycotts organized or documented, and I've seen the newspaper clippings, were in the early 1920s, organized against Jews. That's two and a half decades before the establishment of the State of Israel. They were boycotting Jewish businesses in what was then the British Mandate of Palestine. In 1944, the Arab League was formed. Israel didn't exist. In 1945, Israel still didn't exist, and they started the boycott of Jews in Palestine. And they continued that up through the present day, although legislation passed in the United States in the 1970s really helped keep that under control. But if you think this is something new, the boycott movement, you're wrong. The boycott movement has existed since the 1920s. It existed throughout Israel's existence. And it was a lot worse under the Arab League boycott than under the BDS movement now. And under the Arab League boycott, major car companies, I believe Toyota, Coca-Cola, would not sell products in Israel. Because if they did, they couldn't sell any place in the Arab world. It was bad. So when I was your age, it was bad. Uh, and I just want to give you that perspective. And it accomplished nothing. I mean, it didn't gain the Palestinians a state. The rejectionism didn't get anywhere. 
But the modern BDS movement, boycott, divest, sanction movement, uh, draws its direct birth from the 2001 Durban conference that took place um, in Durban, South Africa, um, that was so anti-Semitic that the US walked out on it. And that's where the modern BDS movement, as opposed to the old Arab League movement, got its birth. The, uh, I just want to read you, and I promise you I'm not going to read you anything else, <coughs> but the um, uh, uh, now deceased congressman, former congressman, Tom Lantos, I believe he was from California, attended the Durban conference. And uh, he attended particularly what they call the NGO forum, non-governmental organization forum at the NGO conference. And I'll read you what he said about that forum. And that's the forum that gave rise to the BDS movement. He said, another ring in the Durban circus was the NGO forum taking place just outside the conference center. Although the NGO proceedings were intended to provide a platform for the wide range of civil society groups interested in the conference's conciliatory mission, the forum quickly became stacked with Palestinian and fundamentalist Arab groups. Each day, these groups organized anti-Israeli and anti-Semitic rallies around the meetings, attracting thousands. One flyer, which was widely distributed, showed a photograph of Hitler and the question, what if I had won? The answer, there would be no Israel. At a press conference held by Jewish NGOs to discuss their concerns with the direction the conference was taken, an accredited NGO, the Arab Lawyers Union, distributed a booklet filled with anti-Semitic caricatures, frighteningly like those seen in the Nazi hate literature printed in the 1930s. Jewish leaders and I, who were in Durban were shocked at this blatant display of anti-Semitism. For me, having experienced the horrors of the Holocaust firsthand, this was the most sickening and unabashed display of hate for Jews I've ever seen since the Nazi period. Sadly, but not surprisingly, the official NGO document that was later adopted by a majority of the 3,000 NGOs in the forum branded Israel a racist apartheid state, guilty of genocide, and called for an end to its racist crimes against the Palestinians. The document issued out of the Durban Conference is the founding document of the BDS movement. And it calls upon the international community to impose a policy of complete and total isolation of Israel as an apartheid state. So when you hear them shout that Israel's an apartheid state, and I'll address with you why that's not true, but when you hear them shout that, it's not just because some people came to that conclusion. That was the strategy developed at the Durban NGO conference as to how they would organize a boycott movement. And that's why when you hear supporters of the boycott movement interviewed on TV or writing, they will make sure to repeat in at least every paragraph that Israel is an apartheid state because that was the strategy to isolate Israel for that. What then happened is that Palestinian groups, uh, starting right after the Durban Conference, began to issue calls for what is now the international cultural and academic boycott of Israel. Uh, and those culminated in a July 2005 final declaration of boycott, in which they call Palestinian quote unquote civil society calls upon international civil society organizations and people of conscience all over the world to impose broad boycotts and implement divestment strategies, initiatives rather, against Israel, similar to those applied to South Africa in the apartheid era. That is the Durban Conference formula. That is the resolution the American Studies Association has adopted. People don't realize that because they put out a lot of publicity trying to say, well, it's not really, it's that, by resolution, they agreed to this call in 2005 from Palestinian civil society for the international boycott of Israel. So they have agreed to the strategy developed at the Durban Conference. The 2005 guidelines, when that call for international boycott was issued, the Palestinian campaign for the cultural and academic boycott of Israel, and later the U.S. campaign for the cultural and academic boycott of Israel, issued certain guidelines. Those guidelines in the ASA's own materials are frequently referred to. So there is no question that ASA adopted the call in 2005 
and has adopted the guidelines issued for that. The thing, and it's really sweeping, among the things that are boycotted under those guidelines, academic events such as conferences, symposia, workshops, book and museum exhibits, convened or co-sponsored by Israeli institutions. Insti and I'm only reading parts of it. Institutional cooperation agreements with Israeli universities or research institutes, typically involving the exchange of faculty and students. Study abroad schemes in Israel for international students. So I don't know, I assume Cornell, many universities have study abroad in many countries, Arab countries and in Israel. Um, those will be boycotted. Addresses and talks at international venues by official representatives of Israeli academic institutions such as presidents and rectors. Cooperation between Palestinian Arabs and Israeli scholars is boycotted, even though they know it is widely known that the easiest route to securing a research grant for a Palestinian academic is to apply with an Israeli partner. So they want to boycott even Palestinian academics who have any interaction with Israelis. They want to bar Israel from any institutional memberships in world bodies. And the one that I think in some ways is most chilling is publishing in or refereeing articles for academic journals based in Israeli universities. I mean, it's practically book based or burning, that they cannot even participate in an academic journal. So when you look at the totality of this, and you hear people say, well, we only boycott institutions. We don't boycott individuals. That's obviously an absurdity. That is a distinction the American Studies Association has tried to draw, because they knew how unpopular these guidelines would be. In fact, these guidelines were so unpopular that they were originally, as written, part of the ASA guidelines. But even ASA members who were in favor of the boycott protested. And so the ASA purported to issue its own more limited guidelines, but really doesn't reject any of these. Just said, well, again, we're just going to uh, boycott institutions. Oh, and we'll also boycott anybody who's acting on behalf of an Israeli institution. We're also going to boycott anybody who's got an official title with an Israeli institution. So if you're the assistant dean for academic affairs at Tel Aviv University, you're automatically boycotted, no questions asked, and you can't get out of it. If you're an Israeli professor who doesn't have an official capacity, you're not boycotted, but only if you're there in your individual capacity. So for Israeli scholars and academics, they apply, apply a litmus test that is not applied to anybody else in the world. A Syrian academic could come to an ASA meeting with all that Assad is doing in Syria right now, uh, starving Palestinians to death in, in their camps, um, dropping barrel bombs in the middle of cities. With all they're doing, that Syrian can come here, no questions asked. But an Israeli comes here, and they have to certify that they're not there on behalf of their institution. To nobody from any other country, not North Korea, not Russia, not China, from no place else do <coughs> academics have to make that certification. When does this boycott, American Studies Association boycott, end? Well, we don't know, because they don't know. They issued talking points for their members, because they knew this was going to be controversial. They issued talking points. One of the talking points is what is required for an Israeli university to no longer be subject to the boycott. They say, this is a difficult question to answer. And then they basically defer to the US academic and cultural campaign organization for that determination. And if you look at their guidelines, it'll never be over. As long as Israel exists, it'll never be over. So I want to uh, ask you, who does this hurt? Well. Obviously, it hurts Israelis. But if you don't like Israel, you may not care about that. I get that. You don't care that this Israeli scholar can't participate or conduct joint research or whoever, whatever it happens to be. You don't care um, if, for some reason, the Cornell Technion campus were to be nixed. There's actually a separate boycott campaign directed to that. You don't care about it. So I get that. You're not going to get much sympathy from uh, people who are anti-Israel that Israelis are but who else is impacted? Well, you 
U.S. universities are impacted. Remember, they're boycotting all these joint programs, all this joint research, joint medical research, joint uh, engineering research, and all this research is boycotted. They're prohibiting, if they had their way, and these were adopted by universities, which they'd like to happen. No university has done it in the U.S., but they'd like it to happen. All those programs, all those scientific developments that take place in the international community with various scholars participating uh, would be mixed. So it will hurt U.S. universities. It hurts U.S. scholars. It hurts the general academic community. And think of all the advances that come through people attending international conferences uh, from international cooperation and joint research projects, medical advances in medicine and elsewhere. And who else does it hurt? And this is a topic that's really never discussed. It hurts the students. By what right did the faculty tell you what you can participate in, what you can attend, who you can interact with? So when the faculty, and a lot of this is faculty driven, I mean, American Studies Association is a, is a faculty organization. By what right did they take that choice away from students? To me, that's the height of academic arrogance, and it's them trying to enforce their will on students. And that's something that's never talked about, but it's true. This is not, you look at all of these things, and this is not like boycotting sabra hummus. We don't want to eat sabra hummus, go buy another brand. We don't care. Okay? We don't want to drink wine that's made in Israel or that's made in the West Bank. Go ahead. If you don't buy the bottle of wine, you're not hurting anybody. But when you boy, do an academic boycott, you're hurting the entire system. You're hurting other people. Unlike refusing to buy sabra hummus, academic boycotts are not a victimless crime. And the victims are is the entire academic community. And that's why there has been such a reaction from university presidents. Now, I know students generally don't like university presidents. I mean, they're kind of, look at this, you know, they're corporate and they're this and they're that. But they've actually been the adults in the room here. They have a number of constituencies that they have to meet. And one of their constituencies is preserving and protecting the general academic community. And that's why you have over 250 who come out against it, rejected it. I'm not aware of any university president who's been for it. And uh, because they understand that what happens is that once you start these things, they're hard to stop. It's easy to start an academic boycott. But think of the United States. We've had slavery. We've had segregation. We have the vestiges of that. You won't find much trouble finding somebody on this campus to argue that we continue to have institutional racism. Maybe it's not explicit, it's implicit. Why aren't we boycotting our own universities? We're located on Native American lands. Why aren't we boycotting our own universities? What if foreign universities declared they were going to boycott U.S. universities because we invaded Iraq? In fact, the American Studies Association passed an Iraq war resolution. And it wasn't a boycott of anything. It was a condemnation. There's a big difference between condemning something and engaging in an academic boycott. And that irony. There are some professors in the U.S., when you read what they say, they realize the implausibility of their position because they would have to boycott themselves. They would have to boycott their own universities, which are sitting on indigenous people lands, which have contracts with the federal government. There isn't a major university in this country that doesn't have substantial federal contracts, very frequently somehow connected to the Department of Defense. Department of Defense, either directly or indirectly, funds much of the scientific research that takes place on U.S. campuses. So why aren't we boycotting ourselves? Now you can understand why boycotts, academic boycotts, are different than boycotting cyber class, or why. And some professors, um, I think one here at Cornell, has even said that, well, we're boycotting Israel for a few reasons. The first one is, well, 
Nobody has asked us to boycott U.S. universities. Okay, I'm asking you. If you're intellectually honest, quit your job and start boycotting yourself, Cornell. Because you can't tell us that if you were asked to do it, you would, but nobody's asked you. And use that as a justification for boycotting Israel. There's a reason nobody has, I can't say nobody, there's a reason that there's no significant campaigns for the academic boycott of countries we don't like. It's for all the reasons I've just explained. So the mere fact that Palestinian civil society, as a strategy developed at the Durban conference, decided it would ask for this, doesn't actually justify the actions that they're doing. It's at this point where I kind of become a little bit of the parent, and this is going to drive you crazy. It's, well, if they asked you to jump off a bridge, would you do that too? How many times have you heard that stupid excuse from a parent? And the point is, the mere fact that somebody asked you to do it doesn't justify you doing it. Yet that is the number one reason you will hear from American academics who are at the forefront of the boycott, divestment, <coughs> academic movement. What's the next thing you'll hear? You'll hear, well, we're singling out Israel, even though there are all these other bad characters out there, these bad countries, and China occupies Tibet. Uh, Turkey doesn't give freedom to the Kurds who want their own state. There are three or four times as many Kurds as there are Palestinians. Kurds have never had a state. Uh, the Copts in uh, Egypt feel oppressed, 10% of the population. More Cop Coptic Christians in Egypt than there are Palestinians and Palestinian descendants. Um, they don't have the full civil rights. Why, why are we not, well, the US gives aid to Israel. That's kind of number two in the list of reasons. We have a special obligation because of how much aid we give to Israel to crack down on Israel when it does something wrong. Well, I've actually looked at these numbers, and the U.S. gives about three billion, with a B, dollars in military aid to Israel every year. It's almost entirely military aid. Of the three billion, 30 million is economic aid. Israel stopped getting economic aid from the United States a long time ago. Here's the inside track on military aid. It's a subsidy for the U.S. defense industry. Israel takes that $3 billion, and not entirely, but for the most part, goes and buys weapons made in the United States. It keeps our factories rolling, keeps our production lines going. And that's one of the reasons the U.S. gives a lot of military aid to a lot of countries. Palestinians, you probably don't know this, get a lot of aid from the United States. Uh, I think it was 2012 was the last year I, I think I had the number for. Uh, it was about $450 million. But you can say, well, that's not $3 billion. And that's true. But there's only about, depending whose numbers you use, uh, Palestinian Authority controls the West Bank. Uh, they get $450 million a year from the US. You do it per capita, and it's kind of the equivalent of about a billion and a quarter a year, a billion and a half, depending whose numbers you're using. So it is true that Israel receives more aid than the Palestinians, but it's not quite as big a gap as you think. And none of that aid that we give to the Palestinian Authority comes back to the US. So to me, that's something of a lame excuse. You can justify, we, give, we used to give a lot of aid to Egypt. We used to give a lot of aid to Turkey. There are a lot of countries we give aid to. If you figured it out per capita, I'm not sure Israel is really dramatically that far beyond. So that, to me, is not an excuse to single out Israel. Then they say that, well, we have to work for Palestinian educational freedom, that they don't have the full academic freedom that we have, and therefore, that's a reason to boycott Israel. Well, as I've indicated, uh, Israel, um, in Israel, both Israeli Arabs and Palestinians attend Israeli universities. In fact, the founder of the boycott movement, Marwan, not Marwan, uh, Omar Barghouti, Tel Aviv University. I don't know if he's still a student there. It's a little murky. Uh, I understand he was going for his PhD. I'm not sure if he's still going for it, but he attended Tel Aviv University. The West Bank, prior to Israel capturing the West Bank in 1967, the West Bank and Gaza under Jordanian and Egyptian control, respectively, um, zero universities. 
None. Not one. They're in that 24. All of the universities you hear about on the West Bank, Berze, Ber Berze, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, Al-Quds, all of those universities were created since 1967. Think about that. Is it a tough situation in the West Bank? Yes, it is. And I think we have to be honest that the current situation is not a good situation. But it didn't develop just because Israel decided it would make it difficult for a Palestinian student to get to a Palestinian university. These are all security-related matters. It's, there is a cause and effect. I first visited Israel in 1980. There was no separation barrier. There was no wall. You could go freely back and forth. Over 100,000 Palestinians before the Second Intifada worked in Israel proper. And that came to an abrupt halt for the suicide bombings. But a lot of these restrictions on movement are a direct response to suicide bombings. And that's just the reality they live under. You cannot divorce the analysis of what happens on the West Bank from the security situation. It will almost never hear that in discussions from the BDS movement. They make it sound like Israel just woke up one day and decided it was going to start putting up checkpoints. And they exaggerate the number of checkpoints, but there are checkpoints. And you know what? It was about a month ago, they found um, a very sophisticated German-made uh, anti-tank weapon at one of those checkpoints. About a week, ten days ago, they found, found six improvised explosive devices, the type that were very effective against the U.S. in Iraq and Afghanistan at one of those checkpoints. That's the reality of the situation. And it's not a good situation, but you can't make it sound like Israel just woke up one day and decided to make life difficult. And as I indicated, Israeli <coughs> education, while it's not perfect, uh, is dramatically improving Israeli Arab access. In fact, last fall, they passed a special plan to try to increase the percentage of Israeli Arabs participating in higher education it's currently 11% of the students in all of the universities combined in Israel are Israeli Arab versus 19% of the population. But it's getting better. <coughs> so why is Israel really singled out? I mean, they have all these reasons, they have all these excuses, which don't really hold up to scrutiny. They're more pretexts, in my mind, than, than reasons. I mean, it's the elephant in the room. You cannot separate the current BDS movement from the boycott of Jews in the 1920s, what was then the British Mandate of Palestine, from the Arab League boycott, from the Durban Conference. It is a refusal to accept the existence of a Jewish national entity in the Middle East. And that's the reason. And you can't escape it. And is there anything wrong? I mean, this is now a point of negotiations. Is there anything wrong? with referring to Israel as a Jewish state. Well, it was referred that way in the uh, League of Nations, which established the British Mandate in Palestine as the homeland for the Jews. It was referred to as that in the 1947 UN General, General Assembly partition plan, which was not a binding document, it was just a recommendation, but it referred to the creation of a Jewish state and an Arab state. It was referred to that by Harry Truman when he recognized the state of Israel. Uh, it was, I posted this video the other day. It, Yasser Arafat even acknowledged on video that they would be willing to acknowledge a Jewish state and a Palestinian state. So what is wrong with that? And for that, they want to call Israel an apartheid state. What has happened with the academic boycott? Well, there's, there's been a pushback, not just from university presidents and academic organizations, but there's been anti-boycott legislation. And this is, again, getting back to once you start it, where do you stop it? None of it has passed yet, but several states have proposed cutting funding to universities which support, give financial assistance to any group that engages in an academic boycott. <coughs> now that has the boycotters screaming, but that violates our academic freedom. I'm sorry, you can't do that. You can't say we're going to cut off Israel, Israeli academic institution, 
Israeli scholars, Israeli programs, and then complain when somebody says, well, that's fine, we're going to do the same to you. And that's why the university presidents were so smart. This was all foreseeable. None of this is a surprise. I don't know if any of that legislation is going to go anywhere, but a new group was just formed. Yesterday, it was announced, uh, and I mentioned to it, Peter Kleinart and several other progressives, uh, you know, people who are harsh critics of Israel, came out and said that they are both against the academic boycott of Israel and against the legislation. And that what has happened is there's been this false choice presented that if you don't like Israel's policies, that means you have to be in favor of delegitimizing Israel and not having it exist. So when you look at the academic, what has happened is <coughs> there may be other groups that pass this boycott. I'm not sure where it's contemplated right now. I would not be surprised if there are some other groups that pass it in the near future, but I think the momentum has mostly changed. I think the reaction to the ASA boycott was something of, of a wake-up call. And um, you also have to understand about the ASA boycott. And students will often ask, well, what can we do? What can we do? We're just students here. Well, it's who shows up. And the ASA is a perfect example. The ASA, depending whose number, which number you use, their website says they have 5,000 members, but they said there were only 3,800 eligible to vote on the boycott resolution. Let's take 3,800. Total. Only 1,200 even showed up and voted. So a third of the ASA membership eligible to vote even participated in the vote. The vote of those who uh, voted was 800 to 400. And they announced <coughs> two to one sweeping victory. But it was only 800 out of 3,800 members. It's who showed up. And I think you know, what I would suggest to students is that. You have to show up you know, to get involved in student government. UCLA uh, rejected a divestment resolution two weeks ago or so, but it was a close vote. US, UCLA Student Council. Tonight, it's being de uh, debated at the University of Michigan, starting at 7 o'clock tonight. You can get a live feed on YouTube. So you have to show up. You have to participate. If you give up your campuses to people who are hostile to Israel, at student organizations and elsewhere, then you can expect a result. Before I close, uh, and I don't want to run on too long, because I would like to take comments, questions. Some of you may be favorable to what I'm saying. Some of you may be not favorable. I do want to run through. Remember, I started this. If everything they said about Israel was true, it wouldn't justify the boycott. Just as it wouldn't have justified a boycott against this academic boycott against the Soviet Union. It wouldn't justify today an academic boycott against Syria. Think that we should want to interact with Syrian academics to the extent there are still operating Syrian universities. Uh, we should want to interact, and we do massively, with uh, universities and scholars from countries that were bad actors. But not everything they say about Israel is true. In fact, most of it is not true. I'm just going to quickly run through a few of these. Uh, as you have heard me describe, Israel as an apartheid state with a deliberate strategy developed at the Durban conference. Somebody, people didn't just come together and say, oh, you know, Israel's an apartheid state. No, it's a deliberate strategy. But what is apartheid? Well, we know what it is. It's the racial domination, it was the racial domination by a white minority in South Africa of a black supermajority, and it wasn't even close percentages, based on racial classifications and race alone. The International Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid, 1976, talks about the crime of apartheid being similar policies and practices of racial segregation and discrimination as practiced in Southern Africa. The Rome Statute, 1998, talks about it being um, domination by one racial group over any other racial group or groups through certain types of actions. Whatever you want to say about the conflict in the Middle East, it is not a racial conflict. It's a religious conflict. It's an ethnic conflict. But if you look at the Jewish population of Israel, it's one of the most multiracial 
multi-ethnic populations in the world. Half of Israeli Jews are refugees from, or the descendants of refugees from, Arab countries. You have the, Ethi the rescue of the Ethiopian Jewish community. You have the rescue of the Yemen and Moroccan uh, communities. It is a multi-ethnic, you have Iranian uh, Jews, you have Iraqi Jews. I, when I was in Israel last summer, I attended, um, it actually wasn't the wedding, it was like the pre-wedding, but in Israel the pre-wedding is like as big as the wedding. Um, so I attended, uh, one was the parents were Iraqi Jews, the other were Moroccan Jews. I mean, that's what Israel is. If you only read the New York Times or the newspapers, you'd think these were all Europeans, the descendants of Europeans in Israel. They're not. It's a coming together of Jews mostly, or significantly, from the non-European world. The, it's majority rule. It's the exact opposite. So it's a religious issue, and it's a majority rule. Under the current census in Israel, Israel roughly 80% Jewish, and majority rules, just like it does in most other countries, just like it does in the Islamic world. If having predominant religion predominate means you're an apartheid state, then almost every single Arab state, maybe with the exception of Lebanon, would be an apartheid state. Syria, the Alawite minority, essentially runs the government. In Iraq, the Sunnis, under Saddam Hussein, oppress the Shias. I mean, this is what, unfortunately, the history of mankind is. It's the conflict of religions. And that's what you have going on in the Middle East. And, but it's not a racial conflict. It's not a racial domination. And that's why, among other reasons, it's not a part of it. Israeli Arabs have the protection of Israeli law. They vote in elections. They have representatives in the Knesset. Are they full and equal citizens in every sense of the word? My guess is probably not, because that's unfortunately minorities in any country. Jews in the Arab world, before they were expelled after the creation of Israel, were not full participants in those Islamic societies. Like if you ask the Egyptian Coptic Christians, they feel the same way. If you ask the Kurds in Turkey, if you ask racial minorities in the United States, many would feel the same way. That doesn't make it an apartheid state. It is true that Israeli law does not apply in the West Bank because Israel has not annexed the West Bank. In fact, if Israel had annexed the West Bank, you'd hear even larger screams. Most of the population in the West Bank is in territory controlled by the Palestinian Authority. In theory, they have the right to vote in Palestinian elections, but those elections haven't been held on schedule. But that's not Israel's fault. Mahmoud Abbas is in the 10th year of a four-year term. But that's not Israel's fault. They run their own, the majority population in the West Bank is in territory controlled by the Palestinians. Next plan, Israel engages in ethnic cleansing. If Israel engages in ethnic cleansing, then it's frankly the worst ex ethnic cleanser in the history of the world, because the non-Jewish population has grown dramatically inside Israel and in the West Bank and in Gaza. It's just demonstrably not true. The Arab birth rate, until recently, was higher than the Jewish birth rate. That's change now, and uh, you know, I think a lot of people say the so-called demographic bomb is not what it's made out to be, but nonetheless, to say that that's ethnic cleansing is just absurd. There were refugees created in the war started by the Arab countries to destroy the new Jewish state, depending whose numbers you use at the time, the numbers were talked about in the four to 600,000 range, now people say a million but there were almost an equivalent number of Jews expelled from Arab countries who went to Israel, who had an exchange of populations. So, yes, there were refugees created. I have no doubt that in the course of a war, there were expulsions of people.
as has happened in every war that's been fought. But think about what would have happened if Israel had lost that war. It would have been a catastrophe beyond anything. And it wouldn't have been, uh, you know, the way it's turned out with the Jews in control. If the Arab countries <coughs> from as far away as Iraq and Saudi Arabia <coughs> who sent troops to invade Israel in 1948, when it declared independence, if they had succeeded, you would have seen a massacre like you haven't seen since, since Nazi Germany. It's no coincidence that the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem and uh, Arab leaders supported Adolf Hitler. They, in fact, he spent most of his time in Germany during the war, hoping that the Germans would bring the final solution to the Jewish population in what was then the British mandate of Palestine. You'll often see a map, and this is recent, in the last two, three years, a map showing loss of Palestinian territory. And they show 19, pre-1947, the entire British mandate of Palestine as Palestine, Palestinian territory. In fact, by international law, it was designated as the homeland for the Jews. Most of it, it's not like property here. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's the old Ottoman property laws. Most of it was what we would call state-owned land. So most of the coloring on that map was nobody's individual land. It was state-owned land, and it was controlled by the British under a mandate for it to be used to establish a Jewish homeland. So there never has been a country nation called Palestine. They did not lose the sort of percentages that you see on those maps. And they rejected, of course, the UN partition plan. Last and certainly not least, and I'm going to stop with this one, uh, was you'll often hear there are, and I see varying numbers, 30, 50, 100 Israeli laws that discriminate against non-Jews. And they just accept that. And I've actually gone and I've spot-checked those laws. There's a list maintained um, by an organization, I think it's based in New York, a dollar or something like that. And, I, and I've checked, and what are these laws that are discriminatory? They're what the, most of them are, if not all of them, because I haven't checked all of them, I've spot checked them. But the ones they've spot checked are what in the U.S. we would call disparate impact sort of claims of discrimination. The law on its face is neutral, but it has more of an impact on one group than another group. Therefore, it's discriminatory in its impact, if not in how it's written. And one of the laws they cite was the 2011 Citizenship Law, which uh, allows the courts to revoke the citizenship of persons convicted of treason. The theory by this organization is since Israeli Arabs are more likely to be convicted of treason, this is a discriminatory law. But there's nothing in the law that discriminates them. So, in conclusion, and, and I really am happy to take questions or comments, um, even if you don't like Israel, you should be against the boycott. But for students on campus who are pro-Israel, you really need to learn this stuff. It takes, unfortunately, five to ten minutes to explain why something is not true. It only takes five to ten seconds to make the accusation. But you have to really understand this stuff. You have to understand that there is no UN resolution that gives a right of return. There's a UN resolution that says that prevailing authorities should permit refugees who want to return in peace, when practicable, to return. The Arab refugees have never recognized Israel as a Jewish state. They've never been willing to live in peace. And there's nothing that says that in that resolution your descendants can return. And in fact, the, um, it also provides compensation from the responsible authority. Well, who was responsible for that war? It wasn't the Jewish <coughs> state. You've got to understand these things. The International um, Court of Justice has frequently cited that opinion as justifying that Israel illegally occupies the West Bank, or that the apartheid wall um, is illegal. You have to understand how, what the International Court of Justice is. It's not like the U.S. Supreme Court. It's not the law of the land. It can only issue advisory opinions. In fact, if you read their opinion, it's called advisory opinion. And they, there's only one group that can ask them for that advisory opinion. That's the U.N. General Assembly. 
which is always hostile to Israel. What the UN General Assembly did was framed a question designed to get the answer they wanted, gave them the documents, and they're limited to the documents that they're given. In fact, one of the justices, and I've read these opinions, multiple justices, said, we agree with the majority on the principles of law here, but we don't feel that Israel was given a fair chance to present its case factually. So you've got to understand these things. And uh, so the conclusion is, you've got to show up, you've got to participate, and you've got to learn your stuff. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, so you talked about the uh, ASA boycott um, and the global aspect, the national aspect, but I want to bring you back like here like to, to focus a little bit on this campus. What the impact does uh, this boycott have here at Cornell uh, according to the number of professors or faculty follows this uh, a, a boycott and what should be the next steps by students, obviously besides learning the stuff, uh, what else should be done, and maybe you should not do anything. I don't know by head count, you know, yeah. what percentage of professors here support the boycott or don't. And there are, there is at least one very prominent professor who's uh, always lecturing on it and writing about it. I don't know if that's representative or not. My sense is that on campuses in general, the younger the professor, the more likely they are to be hostile to Israel. I think that's just a reality. I don't know that it's a majority, but I think there is a general integrational issue there. I think that a lot of the younger faculty, and I'm just speaking generically here, a lot of the younger faculty in the humanities and in the social sciences, their anti-Israel political posture is indistinguishable from their academic research. I mean, that is what they do. That's what they write about academically, and that's what they do politically. So I can't tell you here, uh, you know, I think that Cornell as a community in its entirety is not, not as bad as some campuses. That's just my sense. Uh, you know, I don't get the sense that there's a groundswell of anti-Israel sentiment here. There certainly are students, and they're certainly entitled to express their views who are against Israel. But I don't get the sense that it's coalescing here. But the students would know better than I would. I mean, I, I see things from one perspective. I don't sense that there's anything big going on there. I, I think that there were some faculty members two, three, four years ago when the Technion joint campus was first discussed who signed on to the boycott. I don't recall it being an enormous number. But I do recall that there were a number of professors from Cornell who signed on to that boycott resolution. My understanding is that they tried to get things done at the Faculty Senate, but were unsuccessful. So, you know, I don't know, really know what it means in terms of the campus, but I think that, you know, everybody's entitled to a view. And I think one of the things that I find objectionable is that a lot of times professors weave their politics into their courses. And that, to me, is a negative because that sends a message to students. When, I mean, one student brought to my attention that the English department had circulated a memo uh, advertising the BDS Israel Apartheid conference that they were having. That sends a message to students that if you're in those courses, your professors are hostile to you. So I, I object to that. I don't do that in my courses, but, you know, Certainly professors can express their view, but I, I think students need to object when those sort of things go on. When they bring those politics into the curriculum for reasons unrelated to what you're studying, I think it's trying to put a thumb on the scale. And I think students need to speak up about that. Now I realize that that's difficult because this is the person who grades you. I remember I was doing some research and writing for the, the website on the Brown University shouted down, a group of students shouted down uh, Ray Kelly, the New York City at the time police commissioner, who wouldn't let him speak on campus, which happens to a lot of Israeli visitors in the US also. But, uh, and I started to study, like, who are these? And one of the professors at Brown came out in support of this. 
So I started to look, you know, just Google, no, no super secret research. And I noticed that even though her course has nothing to do with the Middle East, on her course website, she's been promoting Israeli apartheid week at Brown University. So think about it, you're taking a course for something that has nothing to do with Middle East politics. And on your course website, your professor is promoting Israeli apartheid week. I think that sends a really, and I think students need to address that. But I understand they may be intimidated, but there may be other mechanisms, for example, through an organization on campus. So somebody could approach the university, not because it happened to me, but I'm a representative of this group, and we have noticed that this is a problem. I think those sort of things. Uh, you know, I've yet to see, uh, and that doesn't mean it's not out there, maybe I just filter and only see what I want to see, but I've yet to see in all of the following I've done of the BDS movement for five years now, an academic unit, as opposed to a student group, an academic unit that sponsors an overtly pro-Israel conference. Yet, hardly a week goes by that an academic unit at some university in the country isn't sponsoring a pro-BDS, anti-Israel conference. And I think that sends a negative message. And I think students need to speak up about that because that, that sends a message to students. So I, I think those are a few things that students can do. Show up, and when you see something that you don't think is right, not because you don't like the opinion, but because it's done in a way that is an intimidating sort of factor. And I don't think professors should bring their pro-Israel politics into the classroom. It's not, it's not one side or the other. And that's the whole thing about the academic boycott. I would be absolutely against pro-Israel groups organizing an academic boycott of Arab universities. I'd be dead set against it, and I'd speak out against it. But as far as I know, that's not happening. So you've got to speak up. Anything else? Great. Well, thank you for having me. And one more. there, but Pal Palestinian Authority, Palestine, had an embassy. With, if it wasn't Austria, it was Czech, Czech Republic, one of, one of the central Czech Republic. Um, so they have a lot of the you know, uh, circumstances of a state. What they don't have is territorial control, complete territorial control. They don't have permanent borders. They don't have a lot of different things. Uh, so I don't know that any of the joining organizations makes a difference. The reality is the reality, and if there's only one way they get a state, and that's is if they come to an agreement with Israel. Great, thank you very much. Thanks.